public policy dialogue, research, training, and advice. In so doing, we, we call upon experts at home and abroad to bring their knowledge and experience to bear on issues related to public policy here at home and abroad. To that end, we are pleased to have a distinguished uh, guest with us who I shall introduce more fully later. But in the meantime, I want to ask you to stand for me, please, as I invite Pastor Dave Burroughs of Bahamas State Ministry to begin us off with a opening prayer. Please buy your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for our beloved Bahamas that you have blessed us to be a part of. We humbly ask your guidance as we discuss, deliberate on these issues relating to the WTO and Bahamas. We thank you for men and women who have taken the time to research, consider, and offer opinions and options for us to consider. We pray that we would continue, that you would continue to guide our minds and our thoughts so that we may come to a decision that is in the best interest of our country. I can send it to you. Leading us to a position of continued economic growth and strength. We pray for civility and common courtesy in our discourses. And we pray that at the end of the day, the good of the Bahamas will be preeminent. We thank you for all who have come from there and far. Thank you for our visitors who have joined us. And we pray that this evening would be fruitful and productive. These things we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now let me ask you to continue to stand as uh, we ask uh, <coughs> Jenny Bethel to come and to lead us in singing the national anthem.
see it. I wish now to invite the leader of our distinguished uh, university, Dr. Rodney Smith, to come and bring his official welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. It is a very, very special pleasure for me to stand here and welcome all of you, our very, very distinguished guests, our former Prime Minister, Chairman Rogers, Chairman of our Board of Trustees, and all of our distinguished guests here this evening. I know you did not come here to hear me talk, so I'm going to be very, very brief and say to all of you a very, very welcome to the University of Bahamas. Please know and remember that this is your university. This is our national university. And you're welcome here at any time. We ask you to come and participate in our events as often as possible. We ask you to uh, go to our University of the Bahamas website and find out what's going on on campus on a regular basis. We have a lot of activities here. We are a growing university, and we're very, very happy to have you. Welcome and enjoy the evening. Thank you so much. is just uh, one of the series of lectures that you will uh, have opportunity to participate in uh, through the Government Public Policy Institute. And uh, so I want to invite you also to stay tuned. Uh, I, when I say this to people, I always get this, wow. But soon we're going to have a lecture uh, discussing uh, the merits of the Westminster system. <laughs> See? <laughs> or demerits. <laughs> so stay tuned. Uh, we also will be having shown a health policy lecture. Uh, and so I actually do stay tuned. But uh, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that uh, international trade and uh, trade matters, and the World Trade Organization, and the Bahamas' accession to the World Trade Organization right. are, probably, uh, prob are probably among the most topical uh, subjects uh, in the country. And uh, that they are, uh, if the uh, most recent uh, public domain survey is to be believed, uh, there are large segments mm -hmm. of the Bahamian public that are looking <coughs> for additional information to inform themselves about these matters. And so tonight, we have brought someone whose work, knowledge, expertise, and experience in the area is extensive. Dr. Craig Van Grastek's areas of expertise include uh, trade negotiations and the policy-making process the history and structure of the international trading system, and the relationship between trade, power, and development. Dr. Van Grastek teach, teaches courses on trade policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, both in its degree program and in executive education. He is the author of the history and future of the World Trade Organization, WTO 2013, and Trade and American Leadership, The Paradoxes of Power and Wealth from Alexander Hamilton to Donald Trump. It's Cambridge University Press 2019. As well as numerous other books, chapters, journal articles, and monographs. <coughs> Uh, I have to tell you that uh, we had lunch with Dr. Van Grastek, and I thought that he had become an honorary Bahamian because he's, he dove right in with some crack con and enjoyed himself, and so I think he's feeling uh, more and more at home. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome to speak to us tonight, Dr. Craig Van, Van Grastek, <coughs> adjunct lecturer in public policy, Harvard Kennedy School of Government.
since before there was a WTO. The WTO came into effect in 1995. Prior to the WTO, we had the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT. And the GATT was really just about trade in goods. In the WTO, it's about trade in goods, trade in services, investment, intellectual property rights, a much wider range of issues. Uh, but in the GATT system, at that time, the GATT was really a limited club. The GATT began with about two dozen countries, and over the course of the next 50 years, quite a number of countries exceeded. I started working in trade in the early 1980s, and one of the first things I worked on was countries' accessions. I worked on the accession of Mexico, the accession of Venezuela, and a few other countries. And then in the 90s, I worked on quite a number of countries' accessions to the WTO. So over time, uh, if you count both GATT and the WTO, I think altogether I worked on about 17 countries' accessions prior to, uh, to examining yours. So it's, it's, it's an old topic for me. And I want to emphasize a few points that I've learned in observing countries' accession process and the implementation of the commitments that they make. And a very important one is that accession to the WTO is as much a domestic as an international process, perhaps even more so. Because what a country is really doing when it's succeeding to the WTO is making commitments about what its future domestic policy is going to be. You can't really draw a sharp distinction between domestic and international policy anymore when it comes to trade. When trade used to be defined as the regulation of the movement of goods across borders, when trade was about border measures affecting goods only, and it was tariffs and quotas and anti-dumping <coughs> rules and safeguards and that type of thing, we could artificially say that trade policy was in its own silo. Today, if you think about all the issues that are defined as trade policy, 
there's hardly a ministry in a government that doesn't have some interest in what trade policy is all about, and there's hardly a stakeholder in the private sector that does not have an interest in trade policy, because trade policy ends up affecting our social policies, our environmental policies, our fiscal policies, our foreign policies. I'm a political scientist. I'm not an economist or a lawyer, so I approach these issues from a political perspective, and I understand that in a lot of countries, when there's an accession negotiation, uh, there tends to be, these days, as opposed to in the past when the gap was so narrowly focused, a broad national discussion of these issues. And so it's not surprising to me to see that you have a very vigorous national debate. What I'm very impressed by is the extent to which this government has engaged the public and has been very actively involved in, in finding the views of stakeholders and making very thorough and comprehensive consultation. So that's, that's very important. I don't always see that in other countries. But the three points I want to emphasize, the principal objective throughout in your accession negotiation is to promote a more efficient economy by reducing barriers to trade and making the investment regime more transparent and predictable. That the commitments that a country makes towards achieving this end are best seen not as concessions, but as investments. That a country is, is voluntarily <coughs> placing limitations on the exercise of its sovereignty. That's what all treaties are, a treaty by my definition, is an instrument by which sovereign states agree to place limitations on the exercise of their sovereignty. That's true of economic treaties, that's true of peace treaties, that's true of treaties of alliance. At all times, what countries are doing is they're defining some sort of limitation on what their action will be. Why does a sovereign state do that? Because other sovereign states do the same thing in a multilateral setting. You're entering an international organization in which not only are you defining the limits of what your policy may be and voluntarily placing limits on your policy space, but you're doing so in a context where other countries have made those same types of commitments and you are acquiring in the process enforceable rights to ensuring that they too abide by the same rules that you're negotiating for your accession. There's always going to be winners and losers in any trade negotiation, whether that's a WTO accession or a free trade agreement or what have you. There's always going to be, oops, sorry, this is a special system that I'm just learning. This allows me to draw on the board. I'm not used to this. We don't have this at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> You're more advanced than we are, so you'll, you'll have to forgive my primitive understanding of your technology. Oh, good. <laughs> so the net effect will be positive. I feel confident in that. I feel confident in that because I know that that has been the case for other countries whose accessions I have followed. And I know that other countries that have exceeded the GATT and then the WTO, after a period of transition, uh, I don't know of a country that subsequently wanted to leave the organization having done that. So again, it's thorough consultations that are the key to ensuring that last point. The objective is to make certain that on the whole, consequences are positive. Recognizing that there are going to be winners and losers, and you have to have mechanisms in place for dealing with those domestic interests that uh, may be under greater competitive stress as a consequence of the accession. There we go. Now, one thing to bear in mind is that joining the WTO, it has become an essential attribute of global citizenship. As I said before, when we started with the GATT system, the GATT had about two dozen members, and it was a closed club. And even a lot of the countries that were technically within the GATT did not fully participate. It was largely a, a transatlantic arrangement between the United States and Canada on one side, the European Union and the United Kingdom on the other. Over time, the GATT became progressively larger, and a very important change took place in the 1980s. The developing countries that were contracting partners of the GATT became much more active in their participation. Today, the WTO is virtually a universal institution. If you look at what happened from, from 1995 to 2015, the, the WTO comes into effect in 1995. We still had some very important exceptions. China was not a member. 
Russia was not a member, Saudi Arabia, Taiwan, Vietnam, these are large economies. Ecuador and Panama were practically the only other holdouts besides the Bahamas in the Western Hemisphere. So once Ecuador and Panama had joined, we were really the exception, the last country in the Western Hemisphere that was not a member. Who's left? We've got the countries that are still in accession, and don't quote me on this, but by my way of seeing things, you're the only normal country left. <laughs> Most of the other countries that are still in the process of accession are oil exporters, and there used to be an assumption that the WTO was, was not friendly to, to oil countries. Now virtually every oil exporting country has joined. Who else is left? A few former Soviet republics or Eastern Bloc countries. Uh, some countries that are classified as rogue states. Uh, the, the Iranian and Syrian accessions are not really very active, but technically they are in the process of accession. In the end, if we assume that all of the countries that are still in the process of accession ultimately exceed, all that's left is a very, very small group of countries that mostly are microstates. They're either rogue states like North Korea, although uh, Mr. Trump says he's in love with Kim Jong-un, so who knows. <laughs> but the Micronesias of the world, Micronesia, Monaco, Palau, Turkmenistan, these are, these are not major players in the, in the trading system. And I would say that in the end, you would rather be in the group that has joined than in the group that is not going to be part of the system. Let me be very frank about this. Accessions have gotten more difficult over time. And one of the ways that we can measure how accessions have gotten more difficult over time is how much longer they have taken. So these are the 36 accessions that have taken place in the order at which they were concluded, and I have counted them in number of months it took to complete the negotiations. So 120 months is 10 years, 240 months is 20 years. We have had uh, some countries that have taken 20 years. Russia took almost 20 years. If you complete your accession within the next year or so, it will be 19 years. And that is part of the trend line, that over time, this is, this is a six-member moving average, over time we have progressively gone from it taking just a few years to taking, well, the accession negotiations here are old enough to vote. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so why does it take long? Well, one is, one reason is that over time, the incumbent members tend to take the view that each new exceeding country should agree to everything that was agreed to by the preceding exceeding countries and a little bit more. So the terms of accession tend to be a bit tougher as time goes on, and also uh, the countries that are more recently <coughs> exceeding uh, tend to be countries that have had longer domestic debates over the accession. There are still a number of countries that, if they were to exceed, uh, would be even higher up here. But if you are to conclude your negotiations as planned within the next year or so, yours will be the fourth longest accession uh, to have taken place. Now, let me be frank about this also. More than most other countries, you would be facing a transition. You would be facing an adjustment because up until now, the level of tariffs that you have been imposing are extraordinarily high compared to other countries. There are, there are two ways in which your tariffs are unusual. First, most countries in the world, I'd say 80% of the countries in this world, have higher tariffs on agricultural products than on non-agricultural products. You're one of the exceptions. It's not completely unusual. Brazil is that way also. Brazil has higher tariffs on, on non-agricultural than on agricultural. But the uh, greater difference is you're really off the charts in your average non-agricultural tariffs. So I would say that by most people's perspectives, who look at these issues, Venezuela and Brazil are considered to be countries with relatively high tariffs. So looking at the non-agricultural tariffs of Venezuela and Brazil, they're about 14% or so. Yours is almost 36%. Now that's not uniform. Uh, you're, you have a number of products that are duty-free. You have other products that are subject to tariffs of 45 or 50%. 
What I want you to think about on those tariffs is that on the one hand, yes, they are a protective mechanism that helps to insulate domestic producers from competitive stress. And in that sense, certainly there are constituencies in favor of them. And yes, also they are an important source of government revenue, at least until you replace that source of government revenue with a value-added tax or, or other domestic taxes. But what they also are is a tax on everyone else in the country. They are a tax on the producers who consume the products that are subject to high taxes, and they are taxes on the end users. So I want you to think about this comparison between the Bahamas and the Seychelles. Why the Seychelles? The Seychelles is perhaps the best comparator for you because one, it's one of the most recently exceeded countries. They're about three countries back. The two most recently exceeding countries are Liberia and um, Afghanistan. Uh, prior to that, it's Seychelles and one other country. Uh, Seychelles is comparable to you in a variety of ways. One is they're a middle income country, which is to say they are neither a developed country nor a least developed country. Least developed countries like, for example, Liberia or Afghanistan are treated somewhat differently in the WTO than our middle income countries like you. It's an island economy. It's in the same general range of population size. You are larger, but, uh, uh, but overall they're in the same magnitude. Uh, look at the difference in your tariffs and their tariffs. <laughs> Seychelles has an average non-agricultural tariff that is something like 3%, which is to say about one-tenth the level that you have. Remember what I said before about the commitments that country is making should be considered investments rather than concessions. When you negotiate to reduce or eliminate tariffs on certain goods, it's important to consider not just the impact this may have on the domestic producers of the goods, but also on domestic consumers. And by consumers, I mean both end users and the industrial consumers of the goods. So to the extent that the country uses tariffs to shield some of its producers from international competition, it's asking its other producers and consumers to pay higher costs, which increases the cost of doing business and reduces consumer welfare. So I'll give you just one example. I don't mean to, to pick on one particular industry, but it's one that struck me as, as I was driving about yesterday, which is you're in hurricane country. You have to paint walls quite often. You have to paint buildings quite often. I know about the cost of paint because I do my own painting in my house. So I know what a gallon of paint costs every time I, I have to slap that on. You have to paint much more frequently. You have a 45% tariff on paint. The cost of that tariff is a benefit certainly to your paint producer, but it is also a cost on every consumer who wants to paint their house, and you have to paint your house frequently, it's a cost to every business that has to paint the building, and that gets passed on through the economy in a hidden tax that is applied to everyone. I don't suggest that your paint producer who has up until now <coughs> been shielded from international competition to some degree anyway, by that tariff should have to immediately be subject to a zero duty. The, the actual duty that you will end up with is a consequence of the negotiation you have with your trading partners and it should be phased in over time, and possibly uh, some countries find ways of, of providing assistance for producers to move out of an inefficient sector into another. Those are all domestic considerations for you to take into account. But when you think about the transition of not necessarily coming down to those level of tariffs, but coming down to something that is closer to that than where you are now, bear in mind that what you're talking about is providing a tax cut. And tax cuts have consequences, but those are consequences that tend to be stimulative of the economy. You're also going to be negotiating on trade and services. I'm well aware of the Bahamianization policy. I'm aware also of the different sectors that are of interest to your trading partners in the negotiations they will conduct with you. When I look at the list of products that are subject to Bahamianization, and I also look at the list of products on which the U.S. negotiators have expressed an interest. And, and bear in mind, there is a long-standing tradition 
in WTO accessions for the U.S. negotiators to be much more active uh, than other countries. The, the overlap between them, the Venn diagram, if you may uh, think of it in that way, the areas where you have a sensitivity and they've expressed an interest come down to these different services sectors. And uh, you're going to have to make some important decisions on your negotiating strategy, and you're going to have to pursue your negotiations with your partners, bearing in mind that not every country is expected to give up all of the protections that it has in place. This is a negotiation. One of the things that we're always told by the negotiations experts is, you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. In the process of your negotiation, and this is why the domestic consultations are so important, in the process, you need to think about what your red lines are. So when negotiating over trading services, it's very important to identify in advance your red lines, that's the domestic process of consultation, and devise cogent arguments in support of them. And when I say cogent arguments in support, Every country that is currently within the WTO has at least one sacred cow, one sector that they protect. Some countries have more than one sacred cow. So in the United States, the most sacred of all our cows is the cabotage, is coastal shipping. You protect your coastal shipping. I feel certain that the US negotiators will make no demands of you on cabotage because after all, we're extremely protective in the area of cabotage. In other areas, as I said, or for instance, security services, if you argue that there's a national security argument in favor of, of having some sort of protection for security services, that's a cogent argument. What you need to do is identify those red lines. By red lines, I mean the areas where you firmly say to yourselves, although don't share it with your negotiating partners, on this sector and that sector, we, these are the ones that truly we want to make certain that we limit the concessions that we make, and then prepare cogent arguments for them Bearing in mind that every WTO member has at least one sacred cow, sometimes they have several of them, but no exceeding country retains the entire herd. Okay? So your sacred cows should be limited to any extent. All right. Those are the main points that I wanted to make about your accession. I want to talk about the context in which the succession is taking place also, which is one where there are some serious doubts as to the direction of the trading system, That's primarily it. because of the position of the United States. I know you'll have questions about accession, but we can hold those for the Q&A. So, let me talk a bit about where U.S. trade policy is now headed. And this was the subject of, of my new book. Here's my thesis in a nutshell. I'm a political scientist. In the field of political science, we have something called the theory of hegemonic stability. What does the theory of hegemonic stability argue? It argues that the trading system is a function of the global distribution of power, and the trading system adapts itself to the global distribution of power. Markets tend towards openness when there is a hegemon, and they tend towards closure or discrimination when there is not. What is a hegemon? A hegemon is a country that has both the economic interest in maintaining an open market and the right. political influence to, to coerce or to compel or to convince other countries to go along with it in creating an open market. This was the role of the United Kingdom during the Pax Britannica. This is the role of the United States in the Pax Americana. So in the 19th century, to the extent that we had open markets in the world, that was a product of British hegemony. In the 20th century, to the extent that we had open markets, that was a product of American hegemony. In the period between the British and American hegemony, when the world sort of fell apart in the 1930s, that's because we did not have leadership. The British were no longer providing leadership. We were not yet providing leadership. The argument being that if you do not have a country that has the motivation and the means to argue in favor of an open market, markets tend to closure for greater discrimination. And it's in that sense that I say that the, oh, I'm doing this again? Go away. <laughs> I say that the Trump phenomenon is actually overdue, even if it's overdone. And what do I mean by overdue? Well, the, thank you. The theory of hegemonic stability was developed in the 1970s. So when I was a graduate student in the 1980s, we were all saying, well, we should expect the 
because the United States is declining relative to Japan, that's what we feared at the time, we should expect the United States to become much more protectionist or perhaps more discriminatory. It didn't really happen. The United States did not turn protectionist, although it did become more discriminatory. Discriminatory. We started to negotiate free trade agreements in 1985. Our first partner was Israel. Then we negotiated with Canada. And then we had NAFTA. And now we have 20 FTA partners. But still, up until Mr. Trump, the United States was the principal advocate within the WTO of trade liberalization. So, in a sense, uh, we would have expected someone to have Trump like positions to have shown up. One or two or even three decades before, but in fact we have had consistent presidential support for an open system, and in that sense he is overdue. He's overdone in the sense that the way he's pursuing it is is very. Well, it, 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 it adheres more to his personality than anything else. Let me be polite about it. Too, I won't talk about issues like whether there are cognitive concerns. I'm being polite. So, no matter what fate holds for this president, and let's face it, we could see Donald Trump remain in office for six more months or six more years. We don't know. But no matter what fate holds for him, the United States and, it, and its partners will need to contend with a world in which, first, relative U.S. power is diminished and China's power is rising. Trade discrimination is a tempting tool of foreign policy, and by trade discrimination, I mean the United States is going to tend more frequently towards positive discrimination in the form of negotiating free trade agreements with individual partners and negative discrimination in the form of increasing the use of sanctions with respect to other countries. But, and this is a major argument in my book, the utility of both preferences and sanctions is declining because the US authority in the world has declined and the relative share of the market held by the United States is declining. So, when you see what Mr. Trump is doing and you think to yourself, well, perhaps in two years' time after the next electoral cycle, we won't have to worry about Mr. Trump anymore, <clears throat> and I expect that that is more likely than not, you still have to worry about Trumpism. Because there's no American politician who can unsee what he or she saw in 2016, which is protectionism has a strong base in the United States. Not necessarily a majority, but it's a minimum winning coalition. So, I elaborate on, on several sub-themes of this in the book, which I will not cover because we have limited time. So I talk about the place of ideas in policy making, the relationship between trade and security. I spent a lot of time discussing the domestic diplomacy of trade policy making, including the struggles between the branches of government, the parties and their bases. I talk about the role of the hegemon in defining the scope of issues in the trading system, so how we got from just tariffs to intellectual property rights and services and so forth. I cover all of that. We have very limited time. It's a 500 page book. <laughs> so instead, let me talk about two of my three paradoxes, because the book is about the paradoxes of power and wealth, and two of them should matter to you in the context of our present discussion. One of them is the paradox of hegemony, and I say that the paradox here is that a leader either hobbles itself or it enables its challengers. And what I mean by that is, a country that has achieved hegemonic status is put in the position where, in order to make full economic benefit of its hegemony, it has to sponsor an open trading system. But by sponsoring an open trading system, it is also inviting its challengers to rise. And this is what happened to the British. They created a system that worked to the benefit of the Germans. Ultimately, the hegemony transferred not to the Germans, but to the United States, and that was a relatively easy transfer because we were allies. But who has risen as a consequence of the open trading system that we have created? China, of course. And could we have done any different? I don't think so. We cannot have our cake without China eating it too. And that is the paradox of hegemony. So, this is all based on a theory of hegemonic stability. Just a little background here. Some of you have studied economics, others not. The theory of hegemonic stability is based on the theory of public goods. A public good is different than a private good. Your car, your house, your, your pen. These are all things that you own as private goods. They belong to you. Public goods are different. Public goods are defined as goods that are non-excludable and non-rivalrous in consumption. The sidewalk out there is a public good. 
All of us can use it, none of us want to pay for it. Right? National defense is a public good. Clean air and clean water are public goods. These are all things that the market will not normally provide for us, so we task the state with providing these public goods. An open global market is an international public good. And that international public good is not going to be provided unless we either have a world government, which we do not have and never really will have, or we have a hegemon to provide it. Why? Because public goods tend to be underprovided uh, because everyone has a free rider instinct. We all want someone else to provide public goods and only a hegemon is going to provide it. So the markets were closed before British hegemony. Markets were closed between British and American hegemony. Markets may be closed in the future, or at least be much more discriminatory, if in fact the United States is declining relative to China. So this hegemon has the motive of economic efficiency and the means political power to provide the good. And this paradigm explains the tax for capital Americana. But a lot of the attention that I pay in this book is to the complications that we find in late hegemony when the hegemon is in a decline. So to get a sense of how this has worked out, if you look at the global distribution of GDP, this is shares of global GDP. In the GATT era, they were actually quite stable. If you look at the shares that were held by the European Union, Japan, and the United States, for a long time, we were very concerned that Japan was growing relative to the United States. But collectively, this group of countries held an almost identical share of global GDP for decades. That's rapidly changed recently. We have the WTO comes into effect in 1995. China joins the WTO in 2001. I don't think this is cause and effect. I think it's coincidence, but there's a lot of people who believe that China's rise is as a consequence of the WTO. I won't resolve that debate myself. But what we can see is that overall, these countries have declined in their relative power, their relative economic power. China has increased at a very rapid rate. And this is highly disruptive for the international system. Or another way to put it is to think about them each, and this goes way back to 1820, the relative sizes of the US and Chinese economies using the United Kingdom as our basis of comparison. So one is what the UK was equal to. The United States actually was as large as the UK by 1870. It took a very long time for the United States to take over the hegemonic role from the British because we didn't have the same instincts as the British. We were very insular. China, at the start of this period, was actually far larger than the British, but was even more insular than the United States, very inward looking. There's been a fairly steady rise of the United States, and you can see this sort of smile of the Chinese, who since 1950 grew a bit, and then quite rapidly, most recently, you can see, at least by this measure, we have very nearly equal economies by 2008. This is a somewhat different way of measuring GDP than the one I was showing you before. This is highly disruptive of the international system. So <coughs> that paradox is, is the main one that drives what Mr. Trump is concerned about. I think the Trump administration is right about a few things. They're right that there is a relationship between power and wealth. They're right that there is a relationship between the United States and China that is destabilizing, I think they're wrong about all the ways they're going about pursuing it. We can talk about that in the Q&A. I'm not gonna talk about the paradox of sanctions because that's not of immediate interest to you, but let me just say that in my book I cover the question of how sanctions are paradoxical for the United States because it, it tends to be the case that we find it easy to impose sanctions that do not impose a lot of costs on us. So we, it's easy for us to impose sanctions that don't mean anything. It's very hard for us to impose sanctions on those countries that have risen. So it's easy to impose sanctions on Russia because we have very little trade with Russia. It's very hard for us to impose comprehensive sanctions and to sustain comprehensive sanctions on China because in fact we have a very close economic relationship. But I won't, I won't belabor that point because it's not the one that matters here. Where I'm going to end and then we'll turn to Q&A to something that should matter to you, the paradox of preferences. And the paradox of preferences is that discrimination expands as a tool of policy as its value declines. Now this is paradoxical, think about this. 
At the time that the GATT came into effect, the average U.S. tariff was about equal to what your average tariff is today. We had average tariffs of 30-something percent, 40-something percent. At that time, it would have been extremely beneficial for any country to have preferential access to our market. And at that time, we had no discrimination at all. The United States did not discriminate in favor of anyone except we gave a 20% discount to Cuba. That went away for other reasons. Uh, but it's only when U.S. average tariffs had been drawn very substantially down that we began to negotiate free trade agreements and offer preferential access to our markets at a time when the potential margin of preference available to countries was much lower. So we didn't offer preferences when they would have mattered. We do offer preferences when they don't matter so much. Let me show you what I mean by that. Here is the number of FTA partners. These are the countries that negotiate free trade agreements with the United States. So as of 1989, we had only two such partners, Israel and Canada. Today, we have 20 such partners. The share of preferential imports, that is to say, the share of US imports that are arriving on a preferential basis rose from 1989, and over the course of that decade, from about 12% uh, to about 25%. That is to say, the share of our imports that was preferential was doubling. However, at the same time, this point here is where the tariff cuts that we agreed to in the Uruguay round of GATT negotiations, which was the round that created the WTO, we agreed to cut our tariffs, and we began to cut them over a 10-year period. And if you look only at this period, you'd say, well, the more FTAs we have, the more preferential our imports are going to be. That's not what happened over time. Despite the fact that we have 10 times as many FTA partners today, once those MFN cuts came fully into effect, we cut our tariffs in half in the Uruguay round. So our tariff prior to the Uruguay round was on average about 4%. Our tariff after the Uruguay round has on average been about 2% or a little bit less than 2%. The share of imports arriving on a preferential basis actually then declined about the time that we fully phased in those cuts. Then it plateaued, and it's continuing to decline now. Which is to say, if you say to yourselves, as an alternative to accession to the WTO, perhaps what we might want to do is negotiate a free trade agreement with the United States. A free trade agreement with the United States would have been a wonderful thing a generation ago. Free trade agreement with the United States offers very little stimulus today because our average tariffs are so low, and they are low enough that China finds it very easy to compete on the US market. If you look at the countries with which the United States has negotiated FTAs, and this is a little bit complicated, but let me explain it. On this axis, this is the difference in import growth from an FTA partner. That is to say, at 0%, Imports from that country would be increasing at the same rate as imports overall into the United States. So if the country is below 0%, it's, our imports are growing at a lower rate than the world average. If it's above 0%, our imports are growing at a rate above the world average of U.S. imports. And this is the margin of preference. And what I did is I looked at the U.S. imports from each one of these FDA partners and asked myself, what is the tariff that would be paid if this country, instead of getting duty-free treatment, we're subject to duty. And generally speaking, we do find that there is a close relationship. The greater the margin of preference, the more the country is going to benefit, unless it is a textile and apparel exporter. And if it's a textile and apparel exporter, like our, our half the DR partners, the Central American countries in the Dominican Republic, they can't compete with China in part because they are subject to very strict rules of origin. I won't get technical on you, but the rules of origin are the rules that determine whether a particular garment is going to be considered to benefit from a free trade agreement. And these countries are subject to strict rules of origin. Nicaragua was not in a special deal, neither was Jordan. So these were more preferential FTAs, and in fact, they have done well. But if you have a relatively low margin of preference, you're not going to get much of a benefit from an FTA. And in your case, switching over from your current status to an FTA with the United States would not be particularly helpful because you already have duty-free treatment for most of your goods under the Caribbean Basin Initiative. So there's relatively little for you to gain as a consequence. 
So to return back to where we started, which was about your accession to the WTO, I want to tie this topic into the original topic. Negotiating an FTA with the United States is not a good substitute for WTO accession. The benefits of your duty-free access are less than you might expect. It's also doubtful that the Trump administration would want to do this. The Trump administration announced last year our first three new FTAs under their watch. And who are we negotiating with? United Kingdom post-Brexit, the European Union, and Japan. What do they have in common? They're all big partners. The Trump administration is very mercantilist. They want to negotiate agreements that are going to have a substantial commercial effect. There are many things you have going for you. You're a very lovely country, but let's face it, you're not a very large market. The potential of the Bahamas to correct the U.S. trade deficit is rather low. And so in the order of priorities of the Trump administration, you would not figure very high. And even if you did, the type of terms that they may seek from you are draconian. So to bring it back to the original point about WTO accession, I would very strongly caution you against considering as an alternative to accession an FTA with the United States. I don't think the administration would want to go with, along with you on that. And if they did, the benefits for you would not be great the costs might be relatively high. So, with that, I will stop my comments. It took about the amount of time that I was hoping I could. We've left plenty of time for q and I thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Okay. Thank you for very enlightening. I, I began to get lost with the preferences and tariffs, but I've been tasked to ask you, what can we do for the WTO? Ah, actually there is one thing you can do for the WTO, which is be a sign of progress, be a deliverable. What do I mean by that? Uh, as long as there are more countries wanting to get in than want to get out, it's taken as a favorable sign. Let me let me back up and tell you a little story. 2012, the WTO asked me to write their official history. They say, we want you to write the history of the WTO. And I said, because already by that time, there were some concerns about the WTO because it had not really fulfilled its legislative function. We're not negotiating a lot of agreements. I said, let me call it the history and future of the WTO because I don't want anyone seeing, oh, the history of the WTO isn't over. The WTO has faced challenges ever since it was founded. It, we had only four years to go from 1995 creating the WTO to the rather disastrous ministerial conference in Seattle in 1999. I don't know if some of you remember it, but that's the one that had a lot of broken windows and, and tear gas and that sort of thing. Uh, so the WTO has faced questions and one of the things that the ministers like to do when they hold their ministerial conferences every two years is have some sort of deliverable. So one type of deliverable is to negotiate some sort of agreement. The trade facilitation agreement was negotiated at, at a ministerial conference in 2015. Uh, sometimes a deliverable at a ministerial conference is to welcome a new member. <coughs> You are the greatest prospect to be member number 165 of the WTO when the next ministerial conference is held in Astana, Kazakhstan in July of next year. There are a couple of other countries that are advanced in the process, but I don't think it's likely. So in the very short term, uh, they're looking for a good story. Now, why do I emphasize this? It's to your advantage. Most of the time, when you are in a negotiation, it is to your disadvantage to have there be a strict deadline. Because the strict deadline usually works to the country, to the disadvantage of the country that is smaller. <coughs> because you're under pressure to complete something in time. In this particular case, they want to have a good story, they want a member, they want to invite a new member into, into joining. 
if you use that properly, uh, that may be somewhat more advantageous uh, in the end game of your obsession negotiation. So in the very short term, there's the good story and becoming member number 165. Over the longer term, to the extent that the WTO becomes truly a universal institution, in which the only ones that are not left, uh, or that are left on the outside are gonna be North Korea and Kiribati and whatever else starts with K in the world. Uh, that is helpful. Uh, but when it comes to uh, full participation, you also wanna be resident. Uh, so one of the things that I often do is I advise countries on their trade policy making system and one of the things that I emphasize throughout is it's very important not merely to be a member of the WTO, but to have a mission in Geneva and to participate very actively in it and to bring your voice into it. Countries that exceed and make that domestic investment in creating their membership and their commitments, uh, they're going to squander that investment if they are not actually present and participating in Geneva. I will tell you that it is an institution that allows countries to punch above their weight. So for instance, there's a long tradition of the Jamaican ambassador to the WTO being a very influential voice for the Caribbean and being a very influential voice for Jamaican interests. So you want to be present, you want to have a mission, you want to choose a person who is well prepared for this. And I can tell you that uh, there are quite a number of countries that despite the fact that they may account for relatively small shares, uh, Chile is an example, Costa Rica is an example, uh, you could be an example of a country that if you make cogent arguments, if you come well prepared, uh, despite the fact that your size in the world is relatively small, that will not be held against you in the WTO. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm a University of the Bahamas student studying yes. marketing, and I just wanted to elaborate more on the benefit of us joining the WTO, just more so like the short term and the long term. What am I to expect when I'm 40 years old? What are my children to expect? Like some more benefits, please. Okay. Um, I would say the principal benefit of the WTO for the, the exceeding countries that I've observed over time is most of the countries that have acceded to the WTO, they do that in the context of a domestic policy reform process. Now, why is this important? This is important because any country can, on an autonomous basis, change its policies. But if that country locks those reforms in to a solemn treaty obligation, what you ultimately are trying to do is to convince the prospective foreign investor that your country is a good place to park their capital. And countries that make solemn treaty commitments either in their accessions or in an FTA negotiation uh, often do so with the intent of saying to the prospective foreign investor, you can trust that the commitment we have made on our tariff rates, the commitment we have made on our investment rules, the commitment we've made on whatever it happens to be, there's a long series of things, the intellectual property rights that you recognize and so forth, that they can trust that this is a permanent commitment on your part because you have enshrined it in your obligations in an international organization where not only have you made that commitment, but also you have secured your rights to the commitments that other countries have made because you then have access to the dispute settlement mechanism of the WTO. And all countries in the WTO are juridically equal. I often stress, however, it's very important, of course, not all countries have the capacity to engage effectively in dispute settlement in order to do so, you again, you want to make sure that you are present in Geneva, that you have well-prepared people, uh, that you have a permanent mission there. And one of the first things that countries are, are urged to do when they <coughs> join the WTO is participate as third parties in disputes so that you can learn how the dispute settlement mechanism works. Relatively small countries in the Western Hemisphere actually have a tradition of being more involved in dispute settlement than you might imagine. We've got the controversial example of the Antigua and Barbuda internet gambling case, which is unusual for a variety of reasons, but we also have Central American countries and Panama and others that are relatively small countries that have participated in dispute settlement and won. My friends in Costa Rica were very upset that the United States had restricted imports of, I can't remember if it was uh, men's underwear or women's underwear, it was some underwear. <laughs> 
I know that matters in the store, but in trade policy, they're all the same. Uh, and they were very concerned with the United States hold it against them if, if they brought a case against the United States. And people like me assured them, no, this is understood that, that there's nothing unfriendly about bringing a dispute. They brought a dispute against the United States. They won in that dispute, and the United States was obliged to change its policy. So what are the benefits? You convince the foreign investor that your commitments are real, and you have access to dispute settlement, and you have a seat at the table if and when the WTO again begins to exercise its legislative function more vigorously and negotiate new agreements. And that's the question. Well, sir? She didn't answer the question. Well, she asked what the, what the benefits are. Now, now it, it depends. If, if what you're asking is, can I tell you that a particular job is going to be available as a consequence. The market ends up deciding that. I mean, I, I cannot <coughs> tell you with great precision precisely what the benefits are going to be uh, on the cost of goods or the jobs that are going to be available because the market in the end makes that determination. But for example, if you want to be very precise, uh, to the extent that the cost of consumer goods may go down as a consequence of greater competition, some of which is going to involve the importation of foreign goods, some of which is going to mean exposing domestic producers to competitive strains that we hope uh, they then are able to produce goods more efficiently and, and, and engage the consumer in that way. We hope that that is the consequence. But can I tell you precisely which ones? No, I'm not an economist. I, 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 I hope I, I can convince you of that, but... I don't know where the, mar where the microphone is. I have the feeling that I can call on people, but the microphone is, there you go. <coughs> uh, my question is, let's say WTO or accession happens with changes. For example, if I'm a farmer, I'm a restaurant owner, uh, I'm a local business person, what changes as far as the beneficial scenario? So for example, somebody who's exporting fish, what, what, what changes in a beneficial way? Okay, uh, let's take the example of, of, of an exporter of fish. Uh, I do a lot of work in developing countries. Lately, I've, I've done a fair amount of work in African countries. And I, I want to disabuse people of the notion that the only thing that affects your access to foreign markets may be the rules of imports in those markets. Uh, uh, in one country after another that I've worked in in Africa uh, that have a fish exporting problem, the main problem, it turns out, is not the tariffs. It's the phytosanitary <coughs> barriers that are not barriers, but measures that are, that are meant for protecting health and safety. The main problem that the African countries that I work in is it, the unavailability of a reliable supply of electricity. Why? You need electricity to produce ice. You need ice in order to keep fish fresh. You cannot export fish to the European Union if you haven't kept the fish fresh. So I don't want to leave you with the impression that when we take a specific example like fish, we can say, ah, if you're not exporting to the European Union, it must be because the European Union has barriers in place. Often what we find is when those barriers have been removed, what remains in place, because I, in the United States, most fish is duty-free. I don't know what the duty is in the European Union, but I believe the African countries would have duty-free access under the Everything But Arms Agreement anyway. So there's no duty <coughs> barrier in their access to the, to the EU market, but it does expose the shortcomings in the domestic capacity to export. And when I work with countries on uh, trade and development issues, often what that means is identifying not those foreign barriers that need, need to be eliminated, but the domestic constraints that need to be addressed. So that particular case is, exemplifies that point. Take another product, however, that is subject to a relatively high tariff. If you are looking at improving your access to a foreign market, and you do identify a high tariff that's in place, there's only three ways to eliminate that tariff. Convince that country to provide preferential access to its market on an autonomous basis, like you currently have an access to the US market under the Caribbean Basin Initiative, or negotiate a free trade agreement with that country, or negotiate a reduction in that country's tariff on a multilateral basis within the WTO. That's the principal benefit that you would get there. But I, I, 
I do want to emphasize that we should not expect that the WTO is going to address every problem in developing countries' exports to developed countries' <coughs> markets, because in a lot of cases, it has to do with domestic constraints. Ordinary person, right? Who's trading? The 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 they they have an experience in the market. What changes? I mean, what, what, what beneficial changes happen? Okay, can you give me give me a scenario because I can address an individual scenario. You gave me yeah. fish yeah. as an example. Okay, let's say. Plastic in the <laughs> Okay, let's say somebody um, owns a restaurant. Okay, uh, <coughs> the restaurant now. What happens after WTO? Yeah, I mean, what happen, what, what happens of a beneficial nature for them? Okay, okay. Uh, I gave you the example before of the paint, right? Think of all the things that a restaurant has to import, all the, or the various things they have to purchase. They may import, they may, they, they, they may source domestically. The taxes that are currently in place in the form of tariffs on those goods, if you if you can replace your reliance upon trade taxes as the principal source of <coughs> revenue with a VAT tax, and in the process you can reduce the taxes that are imposed on the goods and allow the restaurateurs to reduce their, their uh, costs of providing their services, that's a benefit. That's a benefit both to the restaurants and ultimately to the consumers of <coughs> restaurants, the people who go and, and eat in the restaurant. So you're saying lower business costs and the possibility of higher profit. Well, the possibility of higher profit, although if you have a competitive restaurant market, that will also mean uh, uh, lower prices for consumers. So whether, if they're going to be more profitable, that also depends on their, on their competitiveness. But yes, that type of thing. Well, good evening. <coughs> I'm not an economist or an accountant, but I'm um, interested in the shipping with the U.S. and our shipping at right. the borders will not be as affected as some of our other industries. And when you understand in our country who uh, owns shipping, but I'll move on. <laughs> You're not aware probably of the Freeport model. We've had free trade in an island called Freeport from 1955. It's our model that was taken around the world, and we're the last to sign on in the hemisphere. We're having our model come back to us and we know that that wasn't a good model because it worked good for the people who owned the port, but not for the locals. To answer the man clearly, he'll have global competition. And that may be to his betterment, or it may be to his demise if he can't compete. I don't know if that's clear. I'll leave you with this one. I have a plethora of questions, but I'll just one. <clears throat> when we open up all the markets, mine is security. I saw it there. And we had a Prime Minister that reserved transportation and security exclusively 100% for Canadians. Now it's over. I think we should do what... I, I, thought, I thought it was one of the ones that's subject to Bahamianization. Am I... Yeah, it was only for Bahamians, 100%. Right. And now that's on the table, possibly, depending how we negotiate it. It's not. It's not? not. It's not. was not reserved? Not. It's reserved, but not on the table. But he has it listed at the bottom of his presentation, security. He was listing areas. Oh, sorry. So when we open our markets, right, in your opinion, when we open our markets, um, does that open up and make us vulnerable to be outspent by bigger global players. Let me give you an example. We do tourism, yeah. right? And we have these big hotels where we work, and the majority of money leaves. What about the model in a boutique island that I'm from, Abaco, and our previous prime minister? We own the resort, right? And we charge 400 a night. What if someone like Paris Hilton, the Hilton Group came, acquired properties, built what we know as a triplex or a boutique resort, and she outspent us by saying the room is going to be forty dollars a night for the first year. Our four hundred dollar room will never rent because hers is going to be new, modern, etc. Right? We then get outspent and put out of business in our tourism sector, and we are services right goods and services are on the table, and we had a misprint where we said three trillion a year was uh, goods and services made because of our country, but not our GDP, of course. If that's wrong and the figure is one trillion, half a trillion, is this what the world's gonna come to compete with us on? And one more, fisheries. 
will we have where other fishing vessels, once meeting the licenses and regulations, etc., right, can fish our waters and compete with us because of MFN? Let me let me address let me address the subsidy issue. Uh, in the WTO, one of the major agreements is the General Agreement on Trade and Services. The General Agreement on Trade and Services, GATS, is an incomplete project. Well, it's incomplete in the sense that in the Uruguay round, we agreed to the architecture by which countries can make commitments, and there were a whole series of issues that were left to be resolved in the future. So one of them was subsidies. So within the GATS, we don't currently have subsidies rules. And that's one of the holes in the system. That's one of the things that we were hoping to fill in in the current Doha round of, of negotiations, which is, we don't say it's suspended, but in reality, it's been suspended. We haven't, uh, there hasn't been a lot of activity in the Doha round for about 10 years. The last time there was serious activity was in 2008. I would say that if you have a concern over that type of issue, uh, one thing to do is to engage in a coalition with other countries in the WTO in pursuit of subsidy issues and make sure that this is one of the issues that, that is dealt with uh, as the GATS project, some of the issues that, that are within GATS uh, uh, get filled in. I was disappointed with the consequences of, of the GATS negotiations, largely because some of these issues were not fully resolved. and. Uh, I often tell people I'm a services enthusiast. I think services, trade and services, is very important, extremely significant. In most developed countries, it's, it's much more important than goods. It's about 70% of most developed economies. It's a very, very high share of this economy. I'm a, I'm a GATS skeptic. I think GATS is not nearly as effective in the WTO as the agreements that we have on goods for, for the reason that I, that I suggested. Can I be outspent? in my own country by someone with, um, can I be outspent in my own country with someone who has uh, brand recognition and billions of dollars competing with me in my sector, my little sector? Just yes or no? Yes, they can. I have to say, I, I like to be very honest about those issues that of which I am not very well versed, and that is a legal issue on which I do not know because I, I know that theoretically, uh, I, ha I have seen that there are journal articles on the issue of the, the equivalent of a countervailing duty case in goods if someone subsidizes, you can impose a countervailing duty. Uh, I really do not know the answer on services, so I will, I will tell you that that's, yeah. an that's a question I cannot answer. So, so a lot of I'm sorry, Dr. Van Bessick, if I might, just for the benefit of the listeners, because Dr. Van Bessick is not negotiating a particular agreement, yes. Um, but just for your benefit, the area of tourism is already and has always been open for foreign direct investment. So there's nothing for us to negotiate. If there is foreign participation by someone else, that's allowed today. That has, that's the reason why we have Bahama, Atlantis, and all these other uh, properties. So that's not something we're negotiating because it's not an issue. So the question is, can Atlantis outspend Bahama? Right? Uh, in the smaller boutique areas, we do have some Bahamian resorts, but they have tended to operate in a boutique set, setting, and, and some of them flourished in, in that market. But it's not an area that the WTO will change for us because it's already been open for decades. Now, no, the gentleman also had a question about yes, fisheries. So, so, so let me let me answer that. There are some sectors uh, that are subject to regulation outside the WTO. So, civil aviation is an example. Uh, when when it gets to trade and services, we don't do anything on uh, the major areas of civil aviation in the WTO because that falls within ICAO. There are some ancillary things like. Uh, 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 restaurant services for airplanes and that sort of thing, but leave that to the side. So another area of law that is not incorporated within the WTO but is outside it is the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And it's the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, as I understand it, uh, that regulates things like uh, three-mile limit and the 200-mile limit and all of that. As a practical matter, 
I'll again refer to the experience that I've had dealing with African countries. They have uh, territorial rights that they have not been able to enforce because even though the UN Convention says that they can have an exclusive economic zone within a certain range, and I, and I won't give my bad recollection of exactly how many nautical miles that is, they don't have the physical wherewithal. They don't have a Coast Guard in some of these African countries. And it's, it's a well-known issue in the uh, west coast of Africa that there are Chinese fishing vessels that operate within the exclusive economic zones of these African countries. I do not know enough about your circumstances to know if you have the enforcement capacity. But in the same way as I said before, a country's ability to export fish is dependent largely on its reliable energy supply not on what the WTO rules are. Here's another example of, we, we can't assume that everything that's related to trade is dealt with by the WTO. So this is a, a UNCLOS issue. Okay. All right. All right. Good night. Um, your presentation tonight on world trade was excellent. Now, the question I lo I'm asked, I will ask now is uh, why we are not a member of world trade. We seek to become a member. Um, I have an observation in terms of the amount of time we would have been doing the relevant, having the relevant stakeholders involved in the process over the last 17 years. Because there, certainly there were advancements made by previous government over increments over those years. But what hasn't happened is that the Bahamian people were not a part of the process. And so now, we are trying to speed the process without going through due process. And so that's where we have most of our challenges. And how us do a small developing country like the Bahamas <coughs> with its GDP, which is more service-based economy as opposed, as opposed to some other trade arrangement, mm -hmm. which is for the most part, I'd like the example you give with China, where they are and how fast they were able to exceed based on their economy. So it tells me where do they leave the Bahamas as a small uh, developing country? We are more vulnerable than anything else. Really, do we have the ability to negotiate from a power of strength in terms of moving forward with world trade? Or we're going to find ourselves in a in a very adverse situation. So I am very concerned about the fact that um, consultation, we have not been having the relevant meetings over those 17 years that would have better informed the Bayman people who would have been in a position to make that critical analysis and by virtue of doing that, would have been able to decide at what point or whether we are ready at this point to actually be a part of such World Trade Organization. I would like you to expand a little more on that and let us know from your background because of what you said initially, you negotiated for several countries within the advise. different advice. Advice, okay. Advise, uh, advise several other countries based on their economic situation. So you, I, you can tell us as to how we can benefit because we are more service-based and financial-based. They have two pillars. And so we've got to be absolutely certain that we are in a position to protect some of the other elements, like like he mentioned, fishing industry, etc., farming, agriculture ski, because if you don't have the means to feed yourself, you're more dependent, and you become more and more uh, 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 at the mercy of somebody else. So I'm concerned about there were 17 years that, in my opinion, there was, those steps were being made to where we are now, but we the people were not privileged to what was being done. And so that is where our main problem comes from. I operate at something of a disadvantage here because I have not been here for 17 years. I will take your word for it that there is a difference of opinion as between the, the, those consulting and those being consulted. 
I, I will tell you that in a number of countries that I have dealt with in the past, uh, I have not been as impressed as I am here. With, when I speak to government people, my sense is, first of all, they've gone to great lengths to make themselves very aware of the technical issues in the WTO. They have sent people for training. I've had people training in programs in which I'm involved. I know people have been training in the WTO to make sure that this is one of those fields where knowledge is power. Your negotiators are great, have a greater capacity to represent your interests and to understand what is at stake to the extent that they have the technical knowledge and capacity of the issues. That I can speak to because I have seen it myself, and I can tell you that having spoken to a number of your government people, there are other countries that have been in the process of accession where I, as a consultant, am kind of disturbed when I go to a country in which they say, please tell us what to do. I say, no, I would like to, to help train you in order to make those determinations yourself. I would say that relative to your level of development, relative to your size, the people I have dealt with in your public sector who are working on, on these issues are dedicated professionals who are making sure that they're going about this issue in a stepwise fashion. I have been impressed by that. When it comes to the actual domestic consultations that have taken place, I'm not qualified to speak. Yeah, so I have a comment to make and then a question. There you are. Um, the plan is to bring import duties down to 15%. That'll put approximately $700 million in the pockets of all Bahamians. That money, if you multiply it by 1.4, which is the velocity of money, we put over a billion dollars in the pockets of every single Bahamian every year. That would be for consumption. That's the fact. It's a fact of the matter. It, it's, a, it's a fact of the matter. Now, Chicago Line, let me, let me finish. Let me finish. Chicago Line has been on this radio just like every day for the last two months talking about WTO. So to say there hasn't been adequate consultation is absolutely incorrect, okay? Absolutely correct. And if Bahamas are so interested, this room would be crowded. We have to have it in a bigger um, uh, 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 arena, okay? A lot of people talk, but they don't know the facts. What I would like to ask is this. Um, the Bahamas Financial Services has been under tremendous pressure the last 10 to 15 years. We've gone from 550 billion down to 175 billion in assets. They, the the um, restraints put on us really have infringed our sovereignty. In Dubai, in Hong Kong, and in Singapore, the same rules have not been applied. The same rules have not been applied as to the Bahamas. So can we use this as a mechanism to take to the dispute um, um, division of the WTO? When will you join? Because most of our business has ended up in Dubai, Singapore, and Hong Kong. I don't want to seem evasive on this, but when, you, when you're asking a question on which I would need greater legal expertise, my suspicion is that it may not be so, but those are the types of issues on which I then turn to my lawyer friends who are much more knowledgeable than I about, about the specifics. I, I must say, I do not know the answer. I, I suspect not, but I would look to it. That's how you maintain your credit limit. I, 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 don't, I don't want to give an answer on which I, I do not have a grounding. I'm not sure who has the yes, right in the line. There you are. Um, well, welcome to the Bahamas. <laughs> the very first question I was asked um, was asked what are the benefits of our joint development. And the first one that you mentioned, and I think you didn't go into any go into much detail, but the one that, that, was, that you said was that it would give the confidence of the foreign investor that when he comes with his money, that it would be safe and he would be able to conduct business with best practices. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so if that is or her money, I or her say. money, yes. their money. So if that is the utmost or foremost benefit of us joining the World Trade Organization, 
And then our lead negotiator just stood up and said that our major industry, which is tourism, has already, has already been open. So what that says to me is that if our major industry is already open, and this is a negotiation process where there are some wins, and of course, there are some losses, correct, in the negotiation. Well, let's be clear, there's openness and there's transparency. Correct. Well, that transparency is very important. A transparent, predictable outcome in, in which there's a strong commitment to the rule of law and there's the perception of that uh, is extremely important for a foreign investor. Okay, but to my point and to the uh, good negotiator's point, it hasn't stopped the foreign direct investor from coming in in those industries. So, my point to you is this. If in negotiation you have to give, up and you, and you get. And if what you're promising, we already have. Yeah, right. Why, if you're a negotiator, you're willing to give up competition in so many of your local industries yes. that you have control over to get something that I'll leave negotiating say that we already have? To me, that is absolutely absurd. absurd. So if you negotiate for a living <laughs> and you negotiate for something that you already have in your pocket, mm -hmm. why are you willing to open up yourself? Mm -hmm and give up anything that you don't have to. So my question is that. That's the first one. The second one is this. There's been discussions about whether the WTO and our signing or assessing to this trade agreement is something that threatens our sovereignty. And it's been argued back and forth. I want you to clarify for me today. So when uh, those who agree with WTO and those who don't, you can say, Someone who came on their behalf, those who are promoting it, also cleared it up, at least for us. There's an appellate body um, that is attached to the WTO, is that correct? There is for now. There is for now. Well, I, I, I know that the president of the most powerful nation on the earth has promised uh, to defund them, but we'll get to that later. But um, my question is this. When, if the, the, the highest court in the land, the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, <coughs> makes a ruling regards to an international corporation against anyone in this jurisdiction. If that issue is taken to the appellate arm of the WTO, who has the superior authority on that dispute? Ah, well, <coughs> let me answer this question first and get back to the, to the other question you asked. And the last one. Oh. And the last one. Please leave. Well, you're, ta you're taxing my memory, sir. But oh, well, well, this is a good one. Okay. When, when countries when countries get involved in these or in these rules based uh, treaties, that's what it's called, right? A rules based treaties. Um, there is there's a presumption that you're going to be treated fairly, and everyone is going to abide by the rules. Correct. That is the hope. Yes, that is the hope. I, I'm glad you said the hope. <laughs> Already, you mentioned, you mentioned, I don't know if you went into details about it before. The, 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 more, the more powerful nations in this world, when they have judgments against them, and you, and you, you hinted of one, I'm, I came a little late, so you might have gone into detail on how little Antigua and Barbuda got a judgment for over $3 million against the United States of America. $300 million, sorry. And they have yet to receive a penny of that money. So that's number one. And number two, the United States of America has been in, in, involved in subsidies for farming for, for umpteen years, and they're not about to stop it. And the same things that these, multi, these um, industrialized countries want us not to do to protect our industries, they've done it for years to develop their industries and make them stronger so they can compete on the world stage. Mm -hmm. And so here we are today. <coughs> our, our government is, our, our governments and previous governments are asking us now to accept the fact that our industries are ready to take on the world when the basically the ladder is being taken out from us in order to compete on this world stage. So I'm going to sit down now. I think you have, I won't attach your memory anymore. So welcome to the Bahamas again. Thank you. Okay, let me address the issue of the appellate body. Um, I, I don't know if, if the question you were asking is whether the appellate body is the body to which national decisions then get appealed. Because if, if that was your question, it's a misunderstanding. No, no. My question is this. Which, if a company has a problem, right, an international company has a problem, 
with the policies in which the government, the national policies are being executed. And they, have, and, they, and they go to our local courts. Right. And our local courts make a ruling that is not in their favor. If they go to the appellate arm of the WTO, which, which, which decision is binding? Okay, let me be very, very clear about this. Dispute settlement in the WTO is only brought by members, by governments. So the private sector, there's there's no investor state dispute settlement in the well, WTO. Well, I, I agree with that, but I'm saying that what happens is your <coughs> industry goes to the government. Right. And the government represents your cause at the appellate arm of the WTO, correct? Yes, but you're saying that this was a that you would be appealing a decision that was made by your national courts and your national executive branch would be appealing it in the WTO. Well, let me look, let me clarify for you. All right, the mic, the mic, the mic. In in Ontario, all right, in the province in Canada, that they have a they have a, um, a thriving or they have a thriving solar they have a thriving solar industry where they subsidize to a certain to a certain extent the industry. I think it was a ruling, I think maybe from India, or like the Indian government challenged that particular, they challenged that particular um, policy of the province of Ontario. Um, they took it to the WTO appellate arm, uh, the province of Ontario lost, and so the subsidies and the help that they were giving to their industries had to cease. So that's what I'm saying. Now, can the, uh, the, the High Court of Canada go and overturn this ruling, or or can they can the, the industry now continue on and challenge it in the courts of Canada, executing or, or, or relying on their sovereignty to conduct the affairs of their country against that <laughs> appellate ruling made by the WTO? That's a specific case. Okay, answering answering the question not as a lawyer but as a political scientist who observes lawyers, there's something <laughs> called forum shopping, and if you're familiar with forum shopping, it is the practice of anyone who has an interest in a legal case finding the, the legal body that is most likely to rule in their favor. And forum shopping is very complicated when it comes to international disputes because there's a lot of different places that you can take cases. So if, you're, if you are a company, as you correctly say, the company goes to the government and says, can you please bring this case forward? Uh, if you are a company, you can independently take a case to the uh, International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, or ICSID, which is part of the World Bank system. And that does have investor state dispute settlement, provided that it is covered by an investment treaty, a bilateral investment treaty that relates to ICSID. There's also um, another arbitration court and so forth that do involve investor state dispute settlement. But let's take your issue of one where they decide to bring it to the WTO. I, by the way, whenever companies ask me about this, I say, as a company, you have very little interest in bringing a case to the WTO because you are more likely to get a favorable ruling from the perspective of a company within ICSID. Because when you referred to the three, I can't remember exactly what the Antigua and Barbuda ruling was, exactly what value it was, it was three billion or 300 million, there was a, what that actually was, was not a monetary award, but was a, the value of the trade that they were allowed to restrict. That is to say, and they went for something called cross-retaliation, which meant they could violate U.S. intellectual property laws to the value of whatever it was, 300 million or something. So if they wanted to, they could make pirated <coughs> Disney videos and sell them. But this was gambling. This was this was, this was gambling. Right, right. And this and and, and cross retaliation, cross retaliation means that the United States was found to have violated its obligations under the GATS agreement, and the cross retaliation was allowing Antigua and Barbuda to bring its retaliation against the United States under a TRIPS issue, intellectual property rights issue. But it was not actually a monetary award because we do not have monetary awards in the WTO. We do have monetary awards in ICSID. So let us say hypothetically, and this is not so hypothetical, this is a client of mine. I don't often get involved in legal disputes, but sometimes I do. So there was a Canadian company, not in the province of Ontario, but uh, a Canadian company that had a problem with the European Union. Uh, and they wanted my opinion as to whether they should pursue the case in the WTO by going to a government and asking the government to advocate on their behalf 
in a dispute settlement case, and my argument was no, because what ultimately will happen is in a WTO dispute, the only change that is made is the country is supposed to come into compliance with its obligations, and the objective in the WTO is not to make the injured party whole. You as a firm, you want to be made whole, you want to receive a payment, you can get that in ICSID. And that's how they ended up pursuing the case. Dispute settlement in the WTO is really designed in order to enforce the commitments that countries make. Now, to get to the Antigua and Barbuda internet gambling case, you are absolutely correct that the United States did not do what it was supposed to do, which is bring its laws into compliance. I actually teach this case at Harvard when I teach dispute settlement, and I have people read the case and read the results, and then I poll the class and I ask, how many of you think Antigua and Barbuda won? And typically about half the hands go up, and they say, of course Antigua and Barbuda won, because the panel decided in Antigua and Barbuda's favor, and the appellate body decided in Antigua and Barbuda's favor. But the United States has not changed its laws, and that's why the other half of the hands go up. The Antigua and Barbuda case, I, can, I don't want to bore everyone with the details. If you want to give an example of a case that on the one hand shows the capacity of a very small country to win a ruling against a very large country, that's the case. But if you also want to show a case where the very large country did not bring its laws into compliance, that is also the case. I am not happy with the consequences of the Antigua and Barbuda internet gambling case, let me be clear. So earlier today, when you were not in yet, I had mentioned that case, and I said it's, it's special in various ways. That's why I prefer to give the example of my Costa Rican underwear case, because the United States did come into compliance. There's special reasons why the United States not, did not come into compliance, because the argument is that they that their commitment made on gambling services was made in error. This gets very complicated, but yes, if you, if you want to say that this is an example of a large country that did not abide by its ruling, you are, abs you are absolutely correct on that. Now, on the appellate body, uh, there is an issue of whether the appellate body is going to continue to function. Well, it's not a matter of the United States defunding, it's a matter of, a, of approving new members of the appellate body. And there's a dispute that's been going on within the WTO for the last several years in which uh, no new members have been appointed to the appellate body. And when the current members of the appellate body, their terms run out, we may not have an appellate body in place. And that means there's no place to appeal the rulings of the panels. And that's a serious issue. And uh, I will not sugarcoat it. It's, it's a serious problem right now, has yet to be resolved. Personally, my point of view on, on it is this. Let's not resolve it as long as the Trump administration is in office because the changes that they want to bring in the WTO are not the sort that I think are, are most politically sustainable. Let's resolve it when we have a different US leadership. But, but it's a technical issue, so I don't want to get too deeply into it. Your original question about attracting the investor. Let me just reiterate my point that the, many of the countries that have acceded to the WTO have done so in the context of significant domestic economic reform. So in a lot of cases, for example, that has been former communist countries that are moving to a market economy, they lock that in uh, by their WTO accession. Sometimes it has been oil exporting countries that want to have an economy that is more diverse. And so in the process of developing a more diverse economic development strategy, they lock that in by way of WTO accession. You are correct that it is important to look at what the country's commitments are on tourism, absolutely. But what I would do as well is look at, at the, the larger economic development strategy and reform strategy that the government has and ask yourself if you were a foreign investor, looking at the principles that have been established within that strategy, would you feel more or less secure about the permanence and sustainability of that strategy if it became organically related to the country's accession to the WTO? Yeah. So my point is, like the renegotiator said, our number one industry is already open. So if it's already open to join, to join it, to join the WTO, we are now opening other areas of our, uh, of our economy. <laughs> Remember, our first offering uh, which I just read on the on the, uh, on the on the WTO site. Our first offering was really rejected. Our last offering to join it was rejected, and so well, that's that's what they have on the site. I have a copy of it. Anyone wants to see? 
And so they were just saying that they're happy now that we are re, uh, redoing or resubmitting our offer. I just, I just read it. I have a copy of my phone if those who want to see it. But, but what I'm saying is that if we are already open in our, in our number one industry by far, and then if we're going to be, if we're going to be opening up our, the rest of our economy, for example, our, our government contracts, for example, <coughs> our government procurement, that is one. It's going to be open to. To, to all this. Only if a country joins the government procurement agreement, which is an optional agreement within the WTO, well, well, that, well, which mostly developing countries do not join. Well, we're, well, we're, well our negotiating hasn't finished as yet, but, and, 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 and we don't even know. But the, my question is this: in a negotiation, you're giving and you're getting, and so if we're if we are getting what we already have, why would we be giving? Okay. Uh, I would not like this to be just a dialogue yes. between you and me. So, let, so let, me, let, me just, let me just wrap up with one point and then turn to another question. Yeah. You're saying it's an issue about whether or not you're open. I say it's also an issue whether or not you're transparent. Okay. Let's leave it at that. And it's not stopping. But it's not stopping FBI. It's not stopping Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Good evening. Uh, I am the Bahamian that says what everyone else thinks. We have been in this, at this thing now for 17 years. <coughs> we have one negotiating here, the other one is with our party. The other one said that to us joining the WTO, it will be, he don't know if a country could stand the shock of that. You, this gentleman here, the saying, we can sail through it. You had a problem a little while ago, and it should be smooth sailing, that's one. Number two, both of our governments have done a terrible job of educating the people on this thing. If you look at the Bahamas as 10 people, our entire population as 10 people, eight of them don't even know what the WTO is. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> they, they, let me finish, sir. They don't have a clue. But yet still we're here at this point of joining an organization that the people don't know nothing about. And that is wrong. That is wrong. So if we need to take another 20 years to come up to speed, to get educated, let's do that. And if Mr. Ingram or Mr. Lyon, if they care about us, they would agree to something like this. These people don't even have open debates on the subject. They would not have a debate because I'm a part of a group that's anti-WTO. These people won't even sit down on a stage like how we hear it now in front of the audience and get the people hear the pros and the cons. Yeah. They're only talking about pros. That's all they're doing. Talking about pros. You have a million people inside right now who ready to address the cons. Well, I come from the school of thought that, that data is the plural of anecdote. So let me just give you an anecdote. When I checked into my hotel a few nights ago and the, and the lady who was checking me in asked me why I was here, I said I'm working on WTO accession. And she said, oh, and then proceeded to express in detail her views on the topic. Now that's only an anecdote, but I can tell you that I've never checked into a hotel in any of the other 17 countries I worked on where the person doing the checking in was aware of the issue. There, I, anecdotally, it appears to me that there that there is public awareness of the issue. We started that. We started it. Well, why before us? I don't, free, free speech is a great thing, sir. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, we, we, we were supposed to be here for till nine, so we got about seven more minutes, so we'll take, I think, about three more questions. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's not a question of, we just, we have a time frame, and nine o'clock is it. Okay. We just found out that we're going to be drilling for oil, by the way, and that's very important. We just approved the drilling of Bahamian oil. Now, if you add that into the equation, my apologies. Let him warn you. It is unfortunate that you were born under this. It is unfortunate yes. that a good man such as yourself, I've done my research on you, I've been born under this. Uh, sir, 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 I, I love a vigorous national debate. It's human rights. No, it is. It is. Let me put it this way. 
A vigorous national debate is far better than the alternative, which is no debate at all. And and I and I believe and I believe that those I believe that those who have a negative view regarding WTO accession are, are but those who have a negative view are respectful and ask good questions that ought to be asked. And as best I can answer them, I will try to give my answer. The microphone has gone where? Right here. Right here. Yes, sir. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I'm here standing tonight for my eight children. My eight children. What I know in here tonight is some serious stuff. This is big. This is huge. You hear me, people? You better speak. This is time for us to speak because people trampled under for too long. We gotta take this Bahamas by force. This our Bahamas, this is the best. Taking land. These foreigners come in here and, and taking our land from us. We got to stop that. We have to stop it. What this is going to do with our children. I'm, I'm very angry about this situation. And we got to stand firm. And we will not any longer let the China come in here. Are they already here? We will run them out. Who's that in? Who's that in? Who's that in? Let's go. The government, I'm, I'm, I'm very sick and tired of the government. Because they're not doing anything for the Bahamian people. And I'm angry. All of them. All of them. All of them. I go for the afternoon all my life. Where are they going? Let me down. Where are they going? They get nothing from me. They get nothing from the Bahamian people. Bahamians, you better wake up. Three and two now. All of them. You hear me? All of them. You better wake up because, look here, this land will not be our land soon. The WTO got to go. They go. Countries out there that have millions of people crying out, look here, don't let the WTO in your country because it's killing your country that come in. Fishing industry. Oh, that coming. Good afternoon. Good night, sir. Um, good evening. Um, Doctor, what's your name? Is? <laughs> just, just Craig. It's fine. Craig. Um, very, very, very interesting topic. Um, just like Mr. Thompson said down here, back in 2002, there was the Caribbean single market and economy, where Owen Arthur they had meetings at the Hilton. And there were educated, qualified behaviors like myself and others who were talking about WTO and countries in the region that actually joined WTO. And what has happened to them? Let's look at Jamaica. They have joined WTO. You look at their economy, look at their dollar. Let's look at Haiti. They have joined WTO. Look at their economy, and look at the dollar. Look at Barbados. They have income tax and value added tax. Look at what has happened to their economy. The Bahamas have some structural inefficiencies. We have an $8 billion debt that is coming. We import more than we export, so you have a balance of trade. Some of you don't understand that. And for us to be able to go into WTO, not have any structural inefficiencies within our economy being dealt with where we begin to manufacture and produce. When we go into WTO and multinational corporations have balance sheets bigger than countries' budgets, and when they come in here to be able to get things done, governments have proven in the region where multinational corporations and special interests are controlling the order of the day. My question to you is this. So, throughout the region, the countries that have joined WTO, what have been the benefits that you have seen with your own eyes in these countries like Jamaica, like what we who have joined the WTO. I want you to answer that question. Okay, let's, let's be clear. The great majority of the Caribbean countries didn't join the WTO, they joined GATT a long time ago. And so, I'm a social scientist. And as a social scientist, when I want to determine whether A causes B, one of the things I want to look for is proximity between A and B. 
Now, if someone has been in the system since the 1960s, Haiti's been in the system since the very start. I believe they were an original contracting party in 1948. Jamaica, I believe, exceeded upon independence, which was, what, 1963 or so for Jamaica, thereabouts? 62, thank you. Uh, but all the rest of the Anglophone Caribbean countries, to the best of my knowledge, uh, were GATT countries before they were WTO countries. So, if you look at the problems that a country has and you say, well, this country has problems and it's a WTO member, therefore their problems must be caused by being a WTO member, there's not proximity between the two factors. They've been in the system for quite some time. Now, the countries that have been in the system for quite some time, in fact, tend to be countries that have made very few commitments. I'll give you an example of a country that has benefited quite a bit from its WTO membership is Mexico. Mexico joined the GATT system in 1985, and for Mexico, joining the GATT was the first step towards very significant economic reforms. I used to live in Mexico, and I'm very familiar with the Mexican economy, which was very state-oriented when I first lived in that country, which was in 1981. Mexico has progressively become a more market-oriented country, and Mexican growth has been quite substantial. Now, is it a country with problems? Of course, all countries have problems. But in my opinion, to associate any difficulty that a country has with its WTO membership, which in fact is about half a century old, going back to the GATT, is a misassociation of cause and effect. But countries that have more recently joined the WTO and have done so in the context of domestic economic reforms have, I think, generally benefited. As a consequence. Okay. Wow. So welcome to the Bahamas and glad you for watching this session. Um, my question is a simple one. Do you think the government should proceed with just an overwhelming national decision on the WTO or take it to the people through a referendum? Ah. I, I'm not, I'm not qual I am not qualified to speak on domestic policy making in, in that respect. I can tell you, for example, one of the things that as a political scientist I cover often is the U.S. domestic policy making system, which is unique. No other country has one like it, and I never say you should make decisions the way we do. Uh, we have a division of laborers between the executive and legislative branches that is not similar to any other country. Uh, and I, it would be, I would be well outside my lane to suggest how you ought to make your domestic decisions. I really don't want to. Excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry, Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. I want one question answered. One question. I've been asked that day for the mic a long time. Just the last part of last year, the G20 had a meeting. And the G20 all decided that they had to revise WTO. Why did not bring that here? They said they have to revise WTO. Answer that question. Why do you have to revise WTO? I will say that it, it took only a very few years in the history of the WTO for people to start to talk about WTO reform. Uh, we were, we've been talking about WTO reform almost as long as there has been a WTO. Not to plug my own book, but if you, that my WTO history is available online. Yeah, but it's a, it's a G20. Okay, my, my WTO. Big countries of the world. Okay, let me, thank you. Let me answer your question, sir. I'd thank like you. to answer your question. Thank you. So my WTO history is available online for free. Doesn't cost you a cent. In it, one of the things that I cover is one of the fundamental differences between the WTO system and the GATT system is the far greater participation of developing countries in the WTO. The way decisions are made in the WTO is very different from how they had been made in the GATT. The GATT was criticized for having what was called a green room process. What's the green room? A very small room in which a very small number of countries made the decisions. The European Union, the United States, Canada, Japan, India, Brazil got invited as the developing country representatives, and the major decisions got made there, and over time this was politically unsustainable, and that's one of the reasons that we have a WTO in which developing countries are far more active, and they're active not just as individuals but in coalitions. 
and I cover in some depth what are the coalitions in which countries are involved. And let me end on, on this point, which is, if you do accede to the WTO, I strongly urge that you identify the coalitions in which you want to participate, one of which is the recently exceeded members, because recently exceeded members have somewhat different interests than the other countries. But it, okay. it is a system that is better suited to your interests than the GATT had been. Okay, I have two uh, questions. I mean, um, we are already members of the EPA, so if you could have probably explained the difference between EPA and the WTO, because I was told that the EPA is more stringent than the WTO. And also, when you were talking about the benefit I saw for the WTO in terms of goods, is you had mentioned it with lower tariffs. And as an engineer, you're talking about industry. It is very difficult for engineering, for our industry to increase here. For our industry to increase here, if tariffs are so high on, on imported goods, that is not going to happen with high tariffs. So us engineers see a benefit in terms of tariffs. Of, and in terms of the Bahamian public, everyone just talking about services. But the goods here are high. Okay, the only person who then benefited for that, uh, um, from the advent of that or I increase um, duties is Florida. Because that's where all most people go to purchase all of their stuff, all we order it online through quality companies. So I would like you to answer that question about the EPA and the WTO. Okay. Um, the EPA is an example of a free trade agreement. So a free trade agreement with, it, free trade agreements are not a part of the WTO, but they're permitted within the WTO. GATT Article 24 allows countries to negotiate free trade agreements. And when you say stricter, yes, what it, what it means is uh, if, a, if two countries have a free trade agreement with one another, or 20 countries have a free trade agreement, EPA has, I forget how many, it's got the, the 27 members of the EU plus all of CARIFORUM, I think. Uh, so all together, it's what, the better part of 50 countries? It's still an FTA, still a free trade agreement, which means that substantially all of the trade between those countries has to be completely duty free. So one of the differences between an FTA and the WTO is in the WTO, we negotiate over the reduction of tariffs. Sometimes we eliminate them, but mostly we reduce the tariffs. In, in the free trade agreement, which in this case is called an EPA, but that's just another title for an FTA, all those tariffs are eliminated except for some products that may be isolated from it. So in that sense, you are correct. It is, I wouldn't say stricter, it is more comprehensive in its coverage. There are also areas in which a free trade agreement may be what we call WTO plus. When I said earlier that you probably don't want to negotiate an FTA with the United States, and I said that the Trump administration would seek draconian terms, among other things, that means that the commitments that would be sought from you in a free trade agreement would be the elimination of all of your tariffs, as in the EPA, uh, and even stricter of protection of intellectual property rights than is provided for under the TRIPS agreement in the WTO, and investment rules that are stricter than what you would agree to in your accession. Generally speaking, and there's a lot of exceptions to this rule, but generally speaking, if you negotiate a free trade agreement with a major industrialized trading partner, United States, Canada, European Union, Japan, the commitments that are expected of you are much farther than what is expected in your WTO accession. So I'm just wondering, it's a final, it's a final question. I haven't had an opportunity to do this all night. But, but the greatest respect, so thank you very much for coming. It is embarrassing for you, and I understand your position. Uh, it's unfortunate that you were not prepared for this. But clearly one of the most obvious questions I think I asked by my friend, Mr. Omar Smith, was to the extent that the dispute resolution system works, does it benefit small countries? I think that the Antigua decision, the Canadian decision, multiple decisions show that the smaller you are, the more disadvantaged you will be. That's one reason not to join. Equally, the economic conversation has been going on has been very, very sharp tonight. But that is to say that if you're, a, if you're a small economy and you have a, and, and they've already carved out our economy to tell us that which they're going to negotiate away. Can you imagine that? Yeah. They're wow. telling us, they're telling us wow. that seventy percent is already liberalized and that they're sitting around. They think that that what that what that why it's got our permission and they're negotiating away the, the additional thirty percent. A complete and total madness. So I just don't know, you know, again, you know, Bahamians against WTO will invite you back you. So in, a more, in, a more, in a more fair context where we can get your expertise. But unfortunately, you've been set up today. Thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate the invitation. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for us.
Thank you very much. Welcome to the Bahamas. Let me uh, please thank you all for your attention. Um, this is the University of the Bahamas. This is the government and public policy institute. Our responsibility is to bring local and international experts to provide their thoughts on issues. We don't coach them. We don't give them presuppositions. In fact, in fact, Dr. Van Grestek, in his preliminary introduction to me, spoke about some of the issues which uh, he believes and knows from his own experience uh, contributions to this matter. And he said, you know, I don't want to be a problem. I said, Dr. Van Grestek, you are coming to the University of Bahamas. Academic freedom is an entrenched principle of this university. I said, please, sir, feel free to speak as you wish. So I reject out of hand any suggestion that we at this university would take a professional like this gentleman and invite him to the center. Yet you have thoughts that are distinct, different, opposed, up in, in opposition. I have been living with that for 18 years. I know they exist. And so we invited him here because his expertise, his experience, his background is substantial. Uh, there are things relative to our local domestic scenario, the politics of our lives, the culture of our lives, that are not within his expertise. And that's understandable. But to suggest that we set him up is entirely, entirely inappropriate to be said. And I, I apologize sir, that you may have had to suffer that notion. And we thank you very much for that. But let me invite, give you formal thanks to Professor <coughs> University, Dr. Linders. academic officers, certainly I would have echoed very much the same sentiments. We at the university pride ourselves on allowing spaces in which this kind of dialogue must happen. We, I, I picked up on one of, one of, of our guest speakers um, um, uh, caveats. A vigorous national debate is better than no debate at all. Um, if we cannot have informed discussions and exchanges on issues that impact us as a nation, that influence us regionally and indeed within our international context in which we survive, we may as well not have them. So please, I echo the invitation of the chairman, get more people into this space. Get more people into this space. We need to have these kinds of dialogues and exchanges if we are to be informed of our decision. Our chief WTO negotiator and executive director of our Government and Public Policy Institute needs to hear these kinds of exchanges and conversations. And we must pride ourselves on providing the space to make that happen. Pastor, it's good to see you again. Thank you so much for starting us with a prayer. And it is good um, always to be thankful to bring our help to develop an intellect to engage in this way. Uh, Jenny Bethel with her national anthem, her beautiful, wait, is she still here? Or did no. Jenny, no. did she leave? Always, always so good. President Smith, thank you for welcoming us all so ably. Um, that delivery, I would expect nothing else from someone from the Harvard School. <laughs> 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 the context, and we will have you back. You must come back. You must come back. You must come back. Once is definitely gone. And he has now um, sand in his shoes, so he must bring that sand back. Next time we'll have open the bank with four of them. Absolutely. We're always. Can you open it up? No, no, no. I disagree. I disagree. I disagree. <laughs> you mean I'm going to open it up? Hold on now. Hold on. Grand Mr. Girago Lang joined us. He joined us with a promise to have such open dialogues. 
which are part and, part and parcel of the government who have the policy institute. It is the principle on which the institution has been built. It is about academic freedom. It is about after if we have, if we do not have academic freedom, we do not have a university. Amen. The government of public policy has a mandate in that regard to encourage such dialogue and exchanges. Yes. I want to say um, um, make a special thanks, give special thanks to the Ministry of Financial Services, Trade and Industry and Immigration for collaborating with us on this venture. Yes. I, I saw some of the colleagues um, early and had an opportunity to just think with them. Uh, we value this relationship and we trust that we can have uh, many more such um, occasions. I, I think I would be remiss if I did not thank our media um, who stood by us, uh, a UB technology team, our protocol officers, uh, security and campus police, um, um, GPPI, the staff for G. Yay! <laughs> of our executive director. But none of this could happen. None, none of this could happen without the active engagement of the New Orleans. So I want to thank you. As we go our separate ways, remember when you come back, you come back respectfully and to engage in a fashion and a way that makes a difference. We're about nation building. We're about contributing to the region and making a global difference. Thank you all for coming.